Hello, everyone. Good morning, or rather, good evening. I'm really glad to see you all here. I guess you must be quite tired already. It's quite late. Well, if that's the case, you can relax and chill out. This is chill out talk about micro frontends. <coughs> all right. I guess we are ready. My name is Jakub Sowinski. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. On the internet, you can find me as Sufka or Pansufka. On a daily basis, I work as software architect in Stepstone Services. My main area of focus in my daily work is, generally speaking, front-end web development. Now, I joined this company four years ago as a software engineer in order to work on maintenance and development of our core platform main product of this company, which is an online job board. You know, this kind of website where users can uh, search for interesting job offers based on some criteria, uh, read them, browse them, apply for them if they wish, and of course, much, 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 much more. As you can imagine, the application turned out to be a little bit more complicated than I have initially anticipated both in terms of business logic and amount of functionalities, but also in terms of infrastructure, architecture, generally speaking, technical solutions. Basically, it was one big repository with few millions lines of code written without too much attention paid to code separation, isolation, modularity, readability, you know, all of those good practices. Is there a question from the... Or are you just waving? Okay, sorry. But can you hear me at the end of the room? Okay, thanks. So, as you can imagine, the platform was quite complicated, business-wise and technical-wise. Um, I bet you know this from your own experience or from plenty of other talks and articles and resources all over the internet. When I joined this company, the power of spaghetti was already very strong in the code, and we only made it stronger, adding more layers of macaroni on top of it with adding new features. With time, it actually became much and much harder to add a feature without producing a bug, sometimes in entirely unexpected part of the application, theoretically entirely different part of the application. Adding features became harder and harder. Releases went slower and slower, and eventually we got stuck. Back then, it took us one whole week to release new version of our application from our developers' computers to production. We had basically one release per week. Nowadays, we can release pretty much any part of business logic of our application or user interface of our application within 30 minutes from developers' computer to production without omitting all of those standard steps, of course, such as uh, acceptance testing or end-to-end -end testing. We managed to do this with, as a matter of fact, still ongoing transformation from monolithic to service-oriented architecture, but it wouldn't be possible without extending this idea to front-end development. And that's what I'm here today to talk to you about. Extending idea of service-oriented architecture to front-end development, an approach lately often called micro-front-ends. I will go through this topic step by step, tackling one problem at a time. I will start with defining terms micro front end and micro front end architecture, um, explain what's the idea behind, what are, what are the pros and cons of this approach. Then I will move on to this more technical part where I will show you how does it work in our case, how do we do this, uh, what are the main pain points that we are battling and how do we tackle them in our daily work. But let's start from the beginning though. Which one of you have ever heard about micro frontends? I guess most of you, since you have read the title of this talk, but um, the idea is generally new. By the way, who have heard about Dan Abramov? Not many of you, but those who heard about Dan probably know where I'm going with this. So the term is nowadays quite well known, although it was first coined or crafted in 2015, especially in 2019, it became yet another trending IT buzzword that we all are using. It's popular enough to attract, attract attention of the most prominent of our colleagues, our fellow programmers, such as already mentioned Dan Abramov, creator of Redux, maintainer or co-author of React, 
who tweeted in May of 2019 that he doesn't understand the concept. Naturally, this tweet from a guy who has a few hundred thousand followers on Twitter sparked a uh, long and fierce discussion all over the internet. Um, it was used as a reference for plenty of blog posts and um, video, bl video blogs and uh, articles and conference talks like this one, to some extent. So I will too refer to uh, this tweet during my talk today because I want to address issues that were mentioned there. Let's start with the first one. What is microfrontend and what's all the fuss about? So, microfrontend, as I mentioned, or idea of microfrontends is direct extension of idea of service-oriented architecture to frontend development. Therefore, analogically to service or microservice, microfrontend is separate, logically separate part of your application that first and foremost is independent from the rest of your application in terms of its deployment. Moreover, it's best if such part is encapsulating some certain clearly defined part of business logic of your application, and it's also best if it's owned by one team that is responsible for this part of your application end-to-end. -end. Micro front-end architecture, then, would be an approach in which independently deliverable micro-applications or micro-front-ends are composed and served to the end-user as one complete coherent application. Such application may look to our end users like this, like regular website, while under the hood being built like this, collection of separate micro-applications. Each one of those applications has its own code base, has its own repository with this code base, its own pipeline to push this code through from environment to environment, its own version on each one of those environments at any given point of time, and, of course, uh, its own team that is responsible for area in which this application, this part of application is, end to end. Now, the idea of such the composition of our code is obviously nothing new. Uh, only in relation to front-end web development, you might have heard about uh, vertically decomposed applications or self-contained systems or, lately, microservice websites. But we've gained interaction of uh, service-oriented architecture and microservices in last years, also idea of micro front ends become, becomes more and more popular, is getting a lot of traction, and is being widely adapted. You might find a lot of talks and articles coming from companies such as Facebook or Microsoft, uh, where they brag about um, implementing such architecture, implementing such approach in development of their products. Now, if they are doing this, they are not doing it without reason, right? So what might be the reason? I can't tell, I can't speak for Microsoft or Spotify, but I can and will tell you why do we in StepStone do micro frontends. Coming back to Dan Abramov's tweets, he suggested that problems that are solved by this architecture could be solved in a much simpler way, such as good component model. So if it's not about those problems, it must be it must be about something else, like organizational structure. Um, well, I would partially agree with him on that. I wouldn't say that it necessarily solves any kind of organizational structure, but it requires some certain specific structure to put your organization in, and you might find this structure beneficial in a variety of ways. Let me show you what I mean. Assume such application, which consists of separate storages dedicated to separate backend services, dedicated to separate frontend services. And then there is this thin consolidation layer on top of everything. This is how architecture of application that I am working on looks like, of course, much, much, much simplified. Once we put it, this diagram in the context of our organization and add teams to it, some of the benefits of this approach become really clear. As you can see, given such separation of code, separate areas can be owned by separate teams end-to-end. -end. This means that you can, have, you can have small autonomous teams which are heavily focused on customer. Almost every member of such team creates and delivers some value to actual end customer. This naturally increases dedication, commitment, satisfaction of those developers. It also enables those teams to work in greatly reduced scope. You see, in case of our application, business domain, business logic became too big for one person to know it all. In order to efficiently develop our application, we 
had to split it into smaller, narrow areas, logically separated areas, so-called subdomains, and assign them to specific teams to be owned end-to-end. -end. Now, developers in each of those teams can actually become experts on their part of subdomain. And having expert knowledge, both when it comes to technical solutions in that area and business-related issues, directly relates to much better quality of the code they are producing and generally much better solutions they are designing. Those two things that I mentioned, combined with the main assumption of this architecture, the fact that you can deploy any part of user interface from developer's computer to production in some small convenient amount of time and without too much risk, uh, without too much impact on other parts of the application, directly impacts speed and agility of your development. Imagine you have teams which are small, focused, full of experts on what they are doing, that can ship stuff to production from their own computers in half an hour. Such environment encourages often iterations, experiments, basically everything that is encapsulated in this term agile software development. And we want to develop our software in an agile way, so that's why we do it in this approach. Now, additional benefit of this approach would be possibility of progressive refactoring of your application. Having your application split into those logically separated areas by design, you can minimize risk of replacing certain parts with entirely new ones, because you know all dependencies beforehand instead of discovering them during your development. Thanks to this, we can gracefully and progressively replace any part of our application with a newer refactored one whenever and wherever it makes the most sense. Now, of course, besides uh, bragging about all of these pros, I want you to keep in mind a few things that are, well, worth knowing. First one of those is the fact that architecture is a tool. Tool that is designed, in or designed to address and efficiently fix some very specific issues, very certain specific issues. This tool, micro front end approach, works for us because we have those issues that this tool fix, and it doesn't mean that it's meant to be used by everyone and everywhere. Moreover, you might find commonly recommended all over the internet to actually start your projects with monolithic approach. This is because monolith is good, solid, and most importantly, simple pattern that just does the job. Truth is that in mo most cases, most of the applications that are created today will never grow in size to the extent where they will need this kind of decomposition, this kind of scaling by decomposition. When it comes to micro frontend architecture in particular, the most common issue that is pointed out is potential harming fragmentation of development processes, technologies, solutions, and eventually of the application itself. The risk is that dramatic increase in teams' autonomy will lead to decrease in effectiveness and lack of consistency of the application. This risk is valid, if you ask me. We have encountered plenty of issues caused by this kind of risk in our experience with micro frontends. On the other hand, I would say that teams being fully autonomous and fully responsible for the stuff they are doing is actually a good thing. And our developers tend to agree with that, tend to say that this model works for them. There are ways to mitigate this risk, mainly standardization and automation of certain processes that I will discuss in this talk later. Basically, it's about finding good balance between autonomy of teams and common standards shared by them. OK, so, so far we've covered basics of what and why. Let me move on to this crucial part, which means how. Let's start with this diagram you have seen before, specifically with this composition layer that is on top of everything. Uh, on the internet, you will find that commonly referred to as container application. We call it templating engine. On the ground level, templating engine is supposed to do one thing display proper view to our user based on the route that he taken, that he took. Whenever a user enters our website, templating engine pass, matches the request URL with which user entered our website, recognizes which template should be loaded based on this URL, and populates it with content coming from certain fragments which represent separate micro frontends. This kind of task, of course, can be accomplished in plenty of different ways. Some are very simple, some are more advanced. One of the most commonly advised ways to do this is to 
um, employ this technique called server-side includes. This is the feature that is available in most of current uh, web servers. Um, with this technique, you can compose template on the server side um, based on pure HTML template and this variable part that I hope you can see, uh, which will be included by the server. This is HTML part of the setup, and this is uh, Nginx server configuration. The server is ready to set that variable, populate the template based on the variable, and serve it to all users. This approach is, of course, nice and simple, but if you start adding more variables and more templates, you will realize that this is not scaling really well. Therefore, we went for a different solution. We went for a different, we went for heavily modified um, version of Taylor library created by Zalando, um, because this tool lets us define routes, templates, and fragments in simple, convenient configuration files that we can split and maintain separately. Here you can see example of uh, routes to templates mapping. Whenever a user comes to our website with one of those routes, he will be served one of those templates based on that map. Now, here is exemplary template. As you can see, most of the time, such template is just collection of fragments. Each fragment can have its own small configuration placed there, but most importantly, it has one unique ID. <coughs> Now, based on this ID and on the other map that is in different part of templating engine, we recognize which fragments need to be loaded, which micro frontends need to be loaded for every one of those fragments. Then templating engine loads them, populates templates with them, and serve already rendered site to the user. Of course, we have created these tools also due to the fact that there are plenty other responsibilities that could be um, taken care of on this level of our application instead of delegating them to each of our micro front ends separately. List of such tasks include, but is not limited to attaching some standard libraries to every page on our website or sending some tracking, basic tracking data related to the route that user have taken or um, passing around information about A-B test in which the user is currently in. So, templating engine is one thing um, responsible for you know, building the website and serving it to the user, but those micro frontends, they sometimes need to also communicate with each other while being on the website already. This need can be satisfied in plenty of ways, as you can imagine. For example, we are currently using a simple JavaScript library called PubSubJS, which is an implementation of very well-known pattern publisher and subscriber. As you can see in this example of implementation, we take this library and the list of possible messages from our local repository of packages. And whenever this component, which is React component, uh, representing login model of our users, is mounted, so basically um, instantiated on the website, it subscribes to very specific message and will react on that message with very specific action. Here is an example of message publication. Whenever this kind of message is published on the, web, on the page where login model is available, login model will be triggered. As a matter of fact, you can type this exact line of code in JavaScript console uh, when you are on one of our home pages, such as stepstone.de, and login model will be triggered. This is because this API is open, it's exposed in a window object, and this comes to, sometimes comes handy, uh, for example, for testing purposes. Truth is that separate library for such thing is not needed anymore, given the current state of commonly available APIs we have in our browsers. This exact pattern is available and utilized in JavaScript for years now. It's just named differently. Instead of subscribing, we have um, event listeners. We can add event listener. listener. And instead of uh, dispatching, we have, instead of publishing messages, we have dispatching events. This API. Uh, I'm sorry, custom event API, that is another crucial part of this setup, is currently available in all of modern browsers and has been for some time already. And with this approach, you can actually replace uh, code written with PubSub with code written with custom events. Subscribe will be replaced with event listener, and publication will be replaced by dispatch. Custom message will be replaced by custom event that is defined using custom event API. There are other alternatives to this approach. For example, 
um, we could implement interactions between separate micro frontends within one view with one shared global state, possibly implemented with some well-known library such as Redux. Some of our applications, micro applications, use Redux anyway already, and those which don't use Redux, they most likely don't have this need for communication with others, so it wouldn't be much of an overkill for us. On the other hand, having one shared state per view, per whole page, comes with some very handy features. For example, applications can use it not only for communication purposes, but they can also access some shared data that is within this global state, instead, instead of each one having its own copy within itself, which is quite common for, with, for some basic entities such as user ID, for example. Additionally, such state could be put in local storage on user's computer, computer, and whenever he comes back to the website, we could recreate it for him in the same shape as it was when he left the website. Add some service workers on top of it, and you're only one step away from having your application fully functional when user is offline. Of course, that sounds awesome to us, but it's still just purely theoretical argument. We have not tried it out in any way, we are just thinking about it. We're pondering with this idea because added value could be massive, but on the other hand, it always comes with a trade-off. Current impl implementation we have using PubSubJS requires little to no maintenance um, and comes with little to no code itself. While using global state, especially based on some um, certain technology, would come with great need for maintenance and alignments among teams. So, purely theoretical. OK, so this is how it works in general scope, how the page is composed, and how different elements communicate with each other. Let's take a look now. How does it look from developer's perspective? How do developers create micro frontends in our world? As I mentioned before, main problem with this approach comes from main feature of this approach. Autonomy of development teams can cause fragmentation of development and of the application itself. Dan Abramov correctly points it in this Twitter thread that I'm referring to uh, by his analogy to game development. However, this assumption is, in my idea, uh, in my opinion, a result of uh, one big misunderstanding related to concept of micro frontends. Uh, this is a tweet from Jules Gleck, Riot employee who, is, uh, who also took part in this conversation. And she put it in simple words. Adapting this approach does not mean that your teams do not have to talk to each other anymore. As a matter of fact, I would argue that they need to communicate much more, because there are more things to agree upon. Therefore, in order to fight this main risk, main issue of this approach, we create our micro frontends first and foremost in standardized and automated way. In this architecture, you want to have separate code bases for pretty much every other entity of your user interface. Naturally, you will end up with tens or hundreds of them. We need to take control over this scattered landscape, and we couldn't make it without standardization of all of those moving parts and automation interactions between them. So let me now walk you through different areas that needed this kind of treatment and show you how did we apply it to them. Let's start from the beginning of developer's journey, so project creation. When your application is split into several, well, tens or hundreds of different micro-applications by design, chances are that you will create new projects quite often. Therefore, taking an example from our backend colleagues who are working in much more matured, service-oriented environment, we also created a tool for automated project creation. Using this tool, our developer can create new projects within one or two minutes, Project which consists of standard code repository, standard build plan, and standard deployment plan. Now, when I, when I say build plan, I mean a process in which the code, as it is on developer's machine, is processed to the way that can be served to our end user. This involves um, transpilation or compilation with Bubble, some bundling and minification with Webpack, or unit testing with Jest. When I say standardized deployment plan, I mean a process in which we put this processed code on um, some certain environment. And one important note related to deployment plans we have is that 
when user, when developer is creating new project within his, this automated project creation tool, he can define if he wants his project to be deployed as Node.js based service, which will then render this project on the server side and serve it to the user as HTML, or if he wants to deploy it as a static asset to CDN, which will be then handled on the client side. Um, the last part that comes out of this tool, code repository, contains application skeleton. Skeleton is not empty, of course. Uh, there, is, there are some tools that uh, we want to standardize and automate, such as linters in order to enforce uh, some common code style and some scripts for built and deployment. But those are not the most important parts. Coming back to Dan Abramov for one second, probably the last one, uh, he concluded this whole Twitter thread with realization that the idea of micro frontends must be directly related to Web Components API. With this API, one can define some basic structure of his component in vanilla JS and have it implemented under the hood in pretty much any way he wants. With this approach, we would give our teams full autonomy, not only when it comes to the way they work and uh, some minor libraries or technologies they are using, but also when it comes to the main technology they are using, the one that renders their components. Um, so this approach is fully valid and legit, I would say, but we decided to teach this approach. We decided against it because we saw much more pros on the other side of the coin. Our application skeleton consists of sets, cons contains set of well-defined standard technologies all of all our developers are using. Those technologies are um, React, TypeScript, Webpack. Having standardized tech stack enables us to cooperate above teams, create solutions that are shared, not reinvent the wheel all over again with every other library every other team decides to use. Our developers can switch teams whenever they find convenient because there is no technology requirement, different requirement in different team than their current team. Also, performance of, the, of our website is beneficent of this approach because we don't need to load to our user each different library separately. We only you load React for them. We could, and we actually did, go one step further with this approach and implemented something called front-end vendor package. With this package, in this package, there are all libraries that are standard libraries that are shared among all of our micro front-ends, such as React, React DOM, Polyfills, etc. Now, this library is is loaded and cached for our, our user at the beginning of his journey uh, with our website on every single page that he comes to. So uh, all of our micro frontends are shipped with an assumption that those libraries will be provided externally. They don't contain those libraries within themselves, which greatly reduces their size and, of course, impacts the performance in a positive way. Now, another common problem that we solve in standardized way is styling. Um, I guess this is not, this not necessarily is the case for all of applications out there, but for most of them, probably is, because um, our page, like most of applications, I suppose, is quite consistent when it comes to user interface across different pages and views. If that's the case, if you have the same button, for example, on every other page, why define some style related to this button with every other micro front end separately? Truth is that we had this kind of solution in place already before we even started considering migration to this kind of architecture. Originally, it was based on SAS um, and was meant to be single point of truth for every common shared styling we have. It turned out that we have quite a lot of common shared styles um, with time, it became very, very big. Um, on average, we had one release per three days because we had to change it all over uh, with every other new idea we had. And what's most surprising, this repository uh, at the end of its life was more than 130 megabytes, out of which more than 100 was only CSS. I have no clue how did it happen, but we managed to do this anyway. So we tackled this issue. One year ago, we moved to another solution that we are now trying out. This solution was also, also heavily debated in our JavaScript communities for years now, I, I suppose, um, which is CSS in JS. We implemented this idea of CSS in JS with library called styled components. 
in this approach, styles of your component are directly next to the component in the repository, next to JS code of the component. Styles are based on theme property that comes from theme provider, higher order component that we wrap our components in. And is based on some theme variant that we want for a given website. With this approach, we can easily define different variants for different websites, which is the case for us. <coughs> As you can see, a theme is small, human-readable JSON-based file that is not only um, not in risk to grow to such extent as our previous library of styling did, but also can be fully maintained and managed by our colleagues from UX department, which makes a lot of sense given our organizational structure. On a side note, adaptation to this kind of solution and also many other issues that we had uh, with this transformation would be much harder or even maybe impossible if we didn't have one standard tech stack. Imagine that we had to implement different styling solution based on CSS in JS for React, Angular, and every other library we would be using. Also, library of components was much easier to create given this decision to have one standard tech stack. We decided to create this library of components because UI was consistent and we already had common styling in place, so why not go one step further and actually share and reuse whole components and not only their styles? Of course, there are some cons of this approach. There is, this is another tool, another shared code that needs uh, alignments and maintenance. But we found, again, much more pros for that solution in this case. And there are tons of components within our infrastructure that look and behave exactly the same across the pages. So potential for you know, reusability and remove redundancy was immense. We started with setting up tools and processes for this approach. We decided to put all of our components into one repository in an approach so-called monorepo. This enabled us to establish one release build deployment and release process in general for the whole library, as well as enabled us to use tools such as Storybook, a tool that provides graphical user interface through which users can see how our components uh, look like, how they can behave. Good thing about Storybook is that it can be entirely used by also totally not non-technical people, so our product owners or UX designers or anyone can see what building blocks do we have available in the library for their product and how they can behave, what options do they have, how they can use it in their current assignments. Now, versioning problems caused by the fact that we had one repository with all of the components, one library, was tackled by the tool that is called Lerna. With this tool, we can still have all of them in one repository, but have different version for each component, which is very nice. Now, in order to migrate existing components as well as create new ones in the library, for the library, we agreed upon certain process. We realized that more often than not, API of our components is being changed after they are deployed to production. In development, we often do not realize many of the use cases or scenarios in which this component will be put in. So we decided that before a component is added to the library of components and is announced that it's you know, available to be reused, it has to be battle tested first. Once the component leaves on production for some time and proves itself, it can be added to the library as a proposition. Then it's being reviewed by other front-end developers, other colleagues, some tweaks are provided here and there, and then it's merged and released with the new version of the library. Then, after that happens, original creator of such component is expected to switch it in his project implementation from his own implementation to implementation taken from the library. Having common solution for styling and library of common components, um, we are going towards fully blown design system, system which, creates, which is created together by front-end developers and UX designers. Currently, our UX team has their own library of components and not understood as actual implementation of those components, but rather as abstract con conceptual uh, ideas with well-defined purpose. Those two things not necessarily have to be different. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. It makes perfect sense to merge them into one library, remove redundancy, work on them together in cooperation with UX teams, uh, between UX teams and front-end developers. Um, I believe that with tools I have mentioned, 
we, are, we have solid foundation for such solution in future. Now, of course, you can have all of those things when creating your application in pretty much any other architecture I could imagine. What matters here is that with this particular approach, you absolutely need those kind of standards in place, and you'd need them done good. Otherwise, you will not be able to tackle those issues that are caused by fragmentation of your development. It's no different when it comes to testing, which is the last piece of our work that is related to front-end development that I want to touch in this talk. Testing is obviously another place where you would like to create some common standards and automate some processes. You don't want some teams to forget test their software or omit this step when it becomes not convenient. Or you don't want different teams to deliver different solutions with different uh, threshold of quality. So, um, so, luckily, having those automated project creation tools and standardized build plans and deployment plans, we can take care at least uh, of the bottom of this well-known test pyramid out of the box. Mm. As I mentioned, having standardized build plan, we can easily set up steps that are executed in every build plan that is run within our infrastructure. For example, we can ensure that unit tests are always actually executed. Or we can, check, we can ensure that a package is not built if some certain amount threshold of code coverage is not met. Additionally, we can, we have not yet, but we can in future easily add some standard, other uh, standard test steps such as performance or accessibility tests. However, of course, need for alignment in terms of testing is the most important when it comes to the pinnacle of this pyramid, because um, as you know, micro frontends are built in isolation. Therefore, uh, integration or end-to-end or -to -end tests are the, the more important to have in place. As a matter of fact, we had this problem solved already before um, with so-called automated test framework, even before we divided our application from monolith to service-oriented or service-oriented architecture and micro frontends. Um, this automated test framework contains rich collection of tests, end-to-end -end tests written with Selenium, which we are still using to this day. The only change that was required was to split those tests into separate areas and assign them to separate teams so that we don't run all of them with every release, but only those related to the part of the application we are releasing. It is important to note here that it doesn't mean by any means uh, that uh, that we cannot use different tools when it comes to testing or components or styling, etc. The things I have mentioned are the baseline that needs to be met. Um, as a matter of fact, teams are encouraged to take different approaches and extend their tests or uh, add new layers of testing wherever they find needed. That's why we have different teams experimenting with tools such as Cypress or TestCafe or Galen, where they find um, that they need this kind of approach. There is one important lesson that we have learned from our colleagues from this testing team, uh, ATF. Similarly to automated project creation tool or library of components or common styling, those are all shared tools, so is ATF. Um, those tools are meant to be maintained and developed in kind of like open source way, uh, which means that um, they are developed by community of developers and on a basis of open discussion and contribution. However, if maintenance of those things is left to everyone, they tend to de degenerate really quickly, stop being updated or stop being cleaned up, and eventually stop being used. Our colleagues from Quality Assurance were aware of that long ago. Therefore, they appointed specific dedicated owners to their tests framework. We call such owner custodian after Martin Fowler's blog on similar matter. Initially, custodians of this framework was one person, and with time, as it grew in size, we added more people to that team. Nowadays, we have separate automation team, which is responsible for maintenance of automated test framework, among other things. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work like open source anymore. Um, in every team, there is quality assurance engineer who is responsible for contributing to this common shared 
tests framework um, on a daily basis, especially in areas related to his subdomain, while the automation team, which consists of ca custodians of this tool, is responsible for uh, reviewing those contributions, accepting or uh, rejecting them, and general housekeeping. As you can see, there are plenty of shared tools in our micro front-end architecture. Those tools exist in order to standardize our front-end development and avoid many issues caused by fragmentation of this process. Issues that will be avoided only if those things work, only if those things are being used, and those, things will be, those tools will be used only if they are working, if they are adding some value to our developers, not making more troubles for them. Therefore, there is gr great need for clear ownership over each and every one of those tools. Most of them are simple enough to be owned by one person, and it doesn't even need to be specific uh, full-time per person working full-time on such a uh, tool. Uh, in most cases, those are people who are working on in regular, normal product development teams uh, and sacrifice few hours per week for the purpose of maintaining this certain tool that they are assigned to. What is important is that this person is dedicated to this task and that others are well aware of this person's role and all of the processes he set up. So again, there is great need for alignment uh, and communication between developers from various teams. One particular approach we have found working for us when it comes to appointing and communicating tasks like this as well as aligning on any other kind of shared standards or uh, automated tools that we have in our shed, uh, is establishing a community of front-end developers with well-defined communication channels. In our case, community consisting of front-end developers from all teams that are working on the application meets weekly or bi-weekly to discuss and decide upon all of these topics I have touched today and more. Most of the time, developers know very well what issues do they have in their daily work and have some cool ideas how to solve them. It's just a matter of taking them out of their team's context for a while, uh, facilitating discussion, helping them realize that others face the same problems, that those problems can be solved on some more general level instead of only for their team, um, and eventually empowering them to find time and solve those problems in their work time. With this approach, our front-end community created most of the tools and solutions that I have mentioned here in this talk over the last two years, effectively facilitating our transformation to micro front-end architecture. All right, we have went through all of those topics, so I guess that's it when it comes to journey through how do we do micro front-ends in StepStone. To sum up, I would like to point out a few things. When it comes to cons of this approach, complexity of the setup and very high entry level are among them. Delicate balance between teams' autonomy and uh, standard and automated tools needs to be achieved and cannot be disregarded. If you give full autonomy to your teams, it will end up very, very bad. But so it will if you put too much constraints in place. Additionally, it's very likely that you don't need this approach. This approach is uh, meant to be applied in large-scale applications created by tens or hundreds of people. This is, by any means, approach, not an approach you should start with. <laughs> On the other hand, if you actually need this approach and if you manage to set it up properly, um, you can achieve this continuous and agile development of large-scale application with additional benefit uh, coming from possibility of progressive refactoring of such application. Additionally, you can, in controlled way, empower your developers to take full of ownership and full responsibility of the code they are creating. Because of those things, micro frontends were employed in projects that I am working on, and they work wonders for us. If you want to learn more on the subject, here are some learning resources. I especially recommend you Martin Fowler's blog and microfrontends.com, which is created by one of his co-workers. Um, when it comes to stuff related to this presentation, you can find slides on my blog. And later this week, we'll be able to find an article describing pretty much everything I have said to here and more on my company's medium. 
If you'd like to chat about uh, micro frontends or any other frontend related stuff, don't uh, hesitate to approach me or drop me a tweet if you, if you prefer that way. And I would, would like. Would I would like to also remind you about the uh, assessment system or system in which you can some comment my talk or score it. Uh, I have not accessed the system in, as a matter of fact, but I know that it exists. So if you could give some feedback, it will be always much appreciated. Yeah, I think this, this is it. Thank you very much. <laughs>